Okay, so today we're going to continue dealing with uh, wind turbines, get a bit more details. Those guys, continuing from last class. So in terms of wind power machines, uh, windmills, or more properly wind turbines, used for centuries to harness natural power, natural wind power. There's a bunch of different types that have been used. Um, vertical axis drag type, so basically this is the top view of them, wind coming left and right. There's some Savonius types, which again, kind of catch the wind in here, spins it around, same for this guy. So either has two or four kind of blades. Uh, split Savonius, uh, again, same thing here. Wind comes in, gets caught in this little cup and then spins around in that direction. Um, a cup, anemo anemometer, same deal. Have these cups, catch the wind, get spun around. So there's your vertical axis drag type, basically drag coefficient. Um, in these cups is pretty high, which spins it around. There's a vertical axis lift type. Um, again, wind's coming left and right, but now instead of being the top view, this is the side view. So um, wind comes in and basically have these blades here that are shaped kind of like airfoils or airplane wings. And when the wind hits it, generates lift, and that lift force is what spins it around um, this vertical axis. So there's the Darius type. I have a gyro mill type, which is more square or a helical type, um, you know, all same sort of principle. Then the horizontal axis lift type, um, these are kind of ones we're kind of used to for windmills or wind turbines. Have this propeller type, kind of like the three blade design we've seen. Um, so again, wind's coming in and out of the page, hits this, these propellers, propeller blades again, kind of like um, airplane wings, like airfoils, and that spins these guys around. Um, so horizontal axis, Given my axis of rotation is horizontal in these cases. Uh, for these guys up here, axis of rotation is vertical, straight up and down. So here's some examples of those. So standard three blade turbine, horizontal axis type, and then this vertical axis type. Um, this is one of those helical ones that we would have seen. In general, my wind turbines classified in two different ways. So we just kind of saw a bunch of different examples of horizontal and vertical axis. Uh, wind turbines. So that's the first classification, whether the axis is horizontal or vertical. So again, um, axis of rotation, my wind is actually around this horizontal axis um, for the horizontal ones. Wind's rotating around this vertical axis for the vertical ones, obviously. My horizontal axis wind turbines generally have two or three bladed propellers. So that's kind of what we see. Uh, these certainly turn at a fairly high speed mounted on a tower, along with an electric generator. So there's an electric generator up in here um, that, when, as you spin it around, produces electricity. Uh, those guys can produce power in pretty much any wind um, above a light breeze, so as long as it's of a few miles an hour, that can generally get these blades turning and produce energy. Vertical axis wind turbines generally use um, you know, kind of airfoil designs for the blades. Uh, the other way to classify them is how the wind energy is actually harnessed. And this is whether it's due to the drag forces or due to the lift forces that are acting on the blades. So um, one of them collects wind energy through drag forces. All the vertical axis wind turbines, those are generally drag forces. So you know, those cups that we see um, going into a cup has a much higher drag coefficient than going on the outside of the cup. Um, so that's basically drag induced rotation. And then the second is the lift forces. So that's kind of the other ones we've seen those, uh, that second row um, in the first line. So again, here's my drag type, there's my lift type, and then the horizontal ones are generally um, lift type as well. Again, most of these um, are self-starting. So as long as you have a high enough breeze to get them going, um, they'll go on their own. You don't need to actually start them. Um, but there is one exception to that, and that's the lift type uh, vertical axis wind turbine configuration, because those can only produce usable power above a certain minimum um, rotation speed. So they're typically combined with some sort of self-starting turbine so that they can get up to speed and then produce their own energy. So first thing we're going to do is look at the horizontal wind axis turbines. Uh, this is basically 
uh, the same situation we saw in last class for propellers, but in reverse, so flipped around. For propellers, we had a big area on this side coming in the propeller, then a small stream coming out the other side. Um, turn the propeller around, basically just turn my whole control volume around, and that's kind of what I'm dealing with. Have some wind coming in, hits the propeller, propeller then basically spreads that air out, slows it down, and we have this control volume that looks like this. So I have some upstream velocity V. Um, again, the propeller slows that down to some velocity, which we're going to call V times 1 minus A. A here is called the interference factor, basically just how much um, is the wind speed slowed down by this propeller. And then as it goes through to the very end of my control volume, um, it gets slowed down by twice that amount. So V 1 minus 2A is the total velocity coming out of this, and that is kind of my constant velocity at the end. That I'm going to be assuming. Applying standard conservation linear momentum, so whatever coming in minus whatever's going out, I can find a force um, based on that control volume. And so I have 2 pi r squared, r being the turbine radius, uh, density of the air, velocity squared. And that's interference factor A times 1 minus A. So that's my um, axial thrust on the turbine. If one look at conservation of energy, so I'm going to be assuming no losses, no change in internal energy, no heat transfer, nothing, no friction. Um, so I'm assuming all my energy gets conserved. Uh, the power exerted from the fluid stream, 2 pi r squared, rho v cubed, A times 1 minus A squared. So that's the power that I'm getting out of it. And then the efficiency of the wind turbine, uh, most conveniently defined using something called the kinetic energy flux. This is essentially how much kinetic energy is in that initial stream of wind. So if I was to be 100% efficient, I could take out all of this kinetic energy. Uh, of course, it's not going to happen. Um, but that is kind of something I can look at in terms of the efficiency. That is essentially my energy um, going in. So entire kinetic energy. Um, across my stream tube, one half rho v cubed times pi r squared. So basically one half um, mv squared essentially, um, but just dealing with densities and areas. Total efficiency then as usual is power out divided by power in. Power out, um, my equation up here, two pi r squared rho v cubed a one minus a squared power in my kinetic energy flux, one half rho v cubed pi r squared. Uh, the pi r squares cancel out, the v cubes cancel out, the rho cancels out. Um, these twos combine to make a four. Then I'm basically left with a times one minus a squared. So that's my efficiency. Um, depends on this interference factor, how much that um, propeller slows down the turbine. For how much that propeller slows down the wind speed. If you want to find the maximum efficiency, you can do that. Uh, essentially, just take the derivative of the previous expression with respect to a, uh, set it equal to zero. You'll find that that's maximized when a equals one third. So the optimal, um, uh, what's that thing called? The optimal interference factor is one third. Put that back into the expression for the actual efficiency. So put one third back into this equation down here for A, and you'll find you'll get 0.593. So essentially 59.3%. That's the theoretical, theoretical maximum efficiency that you can get from um, these wind turbines, the horizontal axis wind turbines. So that's called the Betts limit. Um, of course, there are some assumptions that, that have gone into this. Uh, I assume the wind turbine um, affects only the air within the stream tube, so nothing outside of that stream tube gets affected at all. Assume the kinetic energy produced as swirl behind the turbine is not accounted for, so it's going to be, um, as the propeller spins around, it's also going to kind of spin the air around. I've kind of assumed that's not happening, so there's a certain amount of kinetic energy being lost due to that. That's not accounted for in this 59.3%. So in real life, um, the efficiency is probably going to be less than 59.3%. Also, any radial pressure gradient is ignored. So again, theoretical, best possible case scenario, 59.3%. Uh, 
efficient C for these horizontal wind axis turbines. If we look at a vertical axis wind turbine, um, so situations slightly different here. I have velocity of the wind coming in, so this is a top view. Um, I have these airfoil type blades spinning around the vertical axis, so my airfoil blades are spinning around. They're spinning around at some um, rotational rate, omega, so they have some linear velocity, r times omega. I'm assuming my velocity of the wind is coming in at a constant angle, um, but then when I look at the lift and drag forces on my airfoil, I need some relative velocity, essentially, um, assuming this guy is stationary, so I need to add the wind velocity and its rotational velocity so V and this R omega vector to get my relative velocity vector. And that's how I'm going to calculate the lift and drag forces um, for this any airfoil. The lift force acts perpendicular to it. The drag force acts in the same direction as, it, as it's going. And so I'm going to need the angle of attack, um, this value alpha, same as this value alpha in there. Um, that's obviously going to be a function of the azimuthal angle. So where I am where this airfoil is in its rotation compared to the uh, incoming wind velocity. Angle of attack is going to have a maximum velocity when theta equals 90. So when this guy is basically perpendicular to him, at that point, the angle of attack um, alpha max is just inverse tangent of my velocity v over r omega. So in that case, r omega is going to be pretty much straight. I'll have a right triangle. And so tangent opposite over adjacent um, this ratio, r omega over v, sometimes called lambda, the tip speed ratio. And I want my maximum angle of attack to be less than uh, the stall angle. So a lot of airfoils are um, going to have a stall angle generally around 10 to 15 degrees. That's um, if the angle of attack is too high. You get a bunch of um, boundary layer separation on the backside of the airfoil. And so you want to stay kind of below that 15 degree limit so that that doesn't happen. If you get uh, that boundary layer separation, you lose your lift. Um, so we don't want that to happen. We want to generate as much lift as possible to get the best possible rotation out of this and most possible energy. So to stay with relatively small um, angles of attack, we want this ratio V over R omega to be a fairly small number. So something like 0.1 or 0.2, um, that way, um, the tangent of 0.1 or 0.2 keeps us down into, the, into these low, um, low angles. The inverse tangent of 0.1 or 0.2. So my lift and drag forces are going to generate a torque on the rotor. Um, for some given value of alpha, I have L sine alpha minus D cosine alpha times omega R. Gives me that actual value of the torque. So again, just kind of using geometry, what the lift and drag forces are. The airfoil is symmetric, um, kind of like this guy here. Then my lift coefficient is CL is just M times alpha. Um, M is just some slope of the lift curve. So um, just basically related to the angle of attack. The larger the angle of attack, the larger the lift coefficient. Um, again, up to these values. So that's when this relationship ends. Drag coefficient can be approximated by um, some zero angle of attack, lift drag, um, drag coefficient CD zero. And then um, another factor that depends on the lift coefficient. So my overall drag coefficient is CD zero at zero angle of attack, um, where the lift coefficient is zero, plus CL squared over pi times um, capital lambda, capital lambda being the aspect ratio of the wing. So basically the um, wing span divided by the wing cord. If we look at this picture back here, uh, the wing span would be the length of this wing um, in and out of the page. So how long the wing is and the wing cord is from the front edge to the back edge. So basically this distance here um, is my wing cord. Wing span divided by wing cord is this aspect ratio. Um, CL and CD both functions of the angle of attack alpha. Um, Alpha is a function of theta. So, um, you know, where this thing is around, when it ro rotates around 360 degrees around the turbine. Uh, so CL and CD are inherently functions of where exactly um, my airfoil is in this rotation. 
So any quantification of the performance of this guy has to be averaged over the entire range of theta. So as this guy spins around, obviously, um, again, looking back at this picture, if this airfoil is down here, I'm going to get um, better lift and drag, better lift forces and drag forces based on the fact that my V is coming straight in. This guy's straight up and down. Um, if this guy's up here at 90 degrees, I'm going to get worse lift and drag coefficients because it's not hitting the airfoil the way wind's supposed to hit an airfoil, essentially. So averaging over the entire um, range of angles. Again, standard efficiency, useful work out divided by available power in. So useful work out, um, the torque was L sine alpha minus D cosine alpha times R omega. I basically just want to take the average value of this. So the bar just means some sort of average value. And then the average value of the um, available power in the wind is L cosine alpha plus D sine alpha times the velocity V. So that's my overall efficiency, the vertical axis wind turbine. Again, I want to convert those bars into an actual expression of things we know. And so actually doing that, averaging that expression over the full revolution from zero to two pi, we get that my efficiency is one minus CD zero times this whole quantity, two over CD zero aspect ratio plus four R cubed omega cubed or V cubed plus V R squared R omega squared uh, divided by one plus CD zero, one over two pi plus three V squared over two CD zero uh, aspect ratio, R squared omega squared. So just taking those um, two expressions we had before, averaging them over the entire range of alphas and thetas gives us these um, kind of nasty expression, but at least we have something where we know uh, for most airfoils, I know CD zero, I know the aspect ratio, and then everything else is just velocities. So example, um, I want to take a gyro mill. So again, to remind you which one this is, this is a vertical axis uh, lift type design. So here's my gyro mill. Um, so wind coming in left and right. This is a side view straight up and down. So as the wind comes in, this kind of spins around that vertical axis uh, to produce power. This thing has a height of 140 feet up and down, diameter 110 feet left and right. Airfoil section is a constant width symmetric section, stall angle of 12 degrees, aspect ratio of 50. Over the normal range of operation, the airfoil lift coefficient is CL is 0.11 times alpha. So again, symmetric airfoil, I have some lift slope, in this case 0.11, depends on the angle. Um, so basically from an angle of zero up to an angle of 12 degrees, um, this is what my CL is going to be. Beyond 12 degrees, this is not going to work anymore, but I'm just going to keep it, um, keep this wind turbine operating so that the maximum angle does not go beyond um, 12 degrees. Drag coefficient at zero ang angle of attack is 0 0.005, so it's my CD zero. This guy rotates at 25 RPMs, want to calculate the maximum allowable wind speed to avoid stall. So again, this is kind of what I want to do. Um, what's the biggest value? Um, in terms of wind speed that I can get to not exceed this 12 degrees at any point in my rotation. And if my power generated at this, I should say maximum speed condition, 150 horsepower, I want to know what the efficiency is. So I'm assuming standard atmospheric conditions, um, density at STP for air is 0 0.00238 slugs per cubic feet. Maximum speed, I'm going to get from the maximum angle of attack. Maximum angle of attack is the tangent of wind speed velocity over omega r. So my maximum velocity then is r omega times tangent of alpha max. So my radius of my wind turbine uh, diameter is 110 feet, so 110 over 2 is the radius. Then omega was 25 RPMs, and then convert that into radians per second. Then maximum angle, 12 degrees, tangent of that gives me 30.6 feet per second or about 21 miles an hour. So that's the maximum speed, maximum wind speed um, where I don't get stall. Um, so anything beyond that, my windmill is not going to be as efficient. 
To determine the efficiency, you need the kinetic energy flux. So again, this is basically how much energy, or how much power is in the wind that's coming in. So if I was, um, if I could harness all that power, that'd be great, but of course I can't. So one half rho v cubed, pi r squared. So pi over two, there's my rho value, uh, velocity cubed, r value 55 feet, um, 110 divided by two, square of that gives me 324,000 foot pound seconds. I divide that guy by 550, gives me 589 horsepower. And so I was told in the question that my um, power being put in was 150 horsepower. The total energy of the air coming in was 589 horsepower. So efficiency for that, for the actuator disc is 0.255. Um, then there's also an efficiency related to the lift and drag. So the lift drag efficiency, the one we saw before, eta L over D, the big complicated expression. So there's basically two efficiencies here. There's one for the actuator disc, um, converting that air coming in into a rotational velocity. And there's also the air going around the airfoil itself and how efficient that guy is. So again, all these numbers we were given in the problem. So CD 0.005. Um, aspect ratio was 50, velocity we found was 30.6 feet per second, uh, radius 55 feet, rotational speed 25 RPMs, you can get that in radians per second, so times 2 pi over 60. Plug all those values in where they belong, and we get an efficiency for the airfoil of um, about 86.8%. So overall efficiency, um, I want to take both those efficiencies for the actuator disk, 25.5%, and the um, airfoil itself, 86.8%, gives me an overall efficiency of about 22% for this particular gyro mill. So last up, just some few little details. Um, a lot of places have something called the wind rows. It's going to tell you where the wind's coming from. And so you can see two different examples of it here. So the bigger the spike is, the more wind comes from that direction. So see for Palm Springs, for example, a lot of the wind comes from the west. Um, LaGuardia, um, wind comes from the west about 9% of the time, but also comes northwest, also comes from the south, a significant amount of time. So the nice thing about Palm Springs is you know which way the wind's coming from most of the time. So you can basically set up your wind turbine to point in that direction. So that's what they do. They have um, tightly packed rows, perpendicular to the wind direction, large spaces downward. Um, so you don't want to have too much behind the wind turbine because that's going to, wind turbine is going to slow down the velocity. And so you want to give it time to speed up again before it hits the next wind turbine. So large spaces downwind. Um, Northern Europe kind of looks a bit more like LaGuardia where the kind of space um, or the wind comes from um, a few different directions. And so even though it's primarily southwest, also other directions, um, so the wind turbines here, um, kind of more uniformly spaced and kind of pointed in a bunch of different directions to capture those varying winds. Another thing is the growth of wind energy. So back in the year 2000, um, not much in terms of wind energy, a little bit, but you can see this doubled roughly every three years as time's gone on since the 2000s. And so um, wind energy is very growing field also, well, one reason is viewed as one of the cleanest of the renewable energies. Um, so it's very, very trendy right now, essentially. Um, so we saw that BETS limit of 59%. Um, but again, that's very theoretical. In the real, real life, um, in practice, um, you get up to 45%, you're doing pretty good. Uh, we saw the examples only 22%, um, primarily due to changing wind speeds and directions. Um, so it's hard to actually get everything in that in those ideal situations. Um, typically, you're somewhere between 15 and 50 percent. Um, again, those higher values are for favorable sites such as Palm Springs, where you know where where um, wind is going. And also, the design improvements. Um, average capacity factor about 32 percent. So generally, what we have is um, you have problems with wind in terms of the wind's going too slow. Um, it's not going to generate enough energy, so it's not worth actually harnessing it. Um, when can be going too fast, in which case 
Um, again, you're going to lose efficiency. I also want to shut down the wind turbines for those. So in terms of um, average operating regime, it's kind of down here. Um, we also don't get these high winds very often. So in terms of how much or how often the wind's actually blowing these high speeds, um, you know, it'd be great to get them, but they don't happen very often. So that's why the most of the operation is down kind of in this yellow box. So that is um, wind energy, basically the last uh, topic for this course. So next up will just be a review um, of the big topics for, um, that we've dealt with in the past few months. So that'll be next lecture.